Okay. Uh, welcome. We're going to take a, a whack at doing some harmonic uh, analysis on the prelude from Bach's first suite for solo cello. This is perhaps his most famous cello piece. Uh, it's certainly easy on the ears. It's daunting for some people to do analysis of because uh, with this monophonic texture and continuously moving 16th notes, it's hard to know what to analyze and how to disregard things in terms of non-chord tones and, and stuff. It's not like it's a chorale where everything's lined up straight or a Mozart piece or a Haydn piece where you can see in the left hand chord structures and things like that. Um, but uh, we can get sort of a gist of what's going on by thinking about what's going on formally and you know what section we're in what what it's trying to do and then we can also um, get some mileage out of chord progressions and devices that we we know about okay so first off um, this uh, prelude like his prelude in C for the well-tempered clavier the first one um, has a four measure phrase at the beginning uh, it's sort of standard and uh and shows us what's going on so let's just take a look here for a minute so first off we're in the key of g major at least to start and the first four measures here are going to give us um sort of like a an idea of what the piece is going to be about and uh you know we haven't changed key it should be a standard progression and even though the texture is the same the harmonies will tell us that we've we've rounded out and made a phrase right and so if you look here there's a g and a d and a b this will not go well if you're not good at reading bass clef um, and so you could if this is hard then you can go i need to read my bass clef better and you can practice so let's take a look then this is a non-chord tone right because it's not part of the gbd chord and it's repeated twice so there we go and so we would call so i'm just going to write up well it's a g chord and i'm going to write myself a one right here because that's the tonic chord it's major i don't need any figured bass because it's in root position meaning that this first thing that sounds off the rest of it is hearing itself in you know in the root there okay now um similar to his prelude and a lot of other people do this too we just recently looked at moonlight sonata and the use of what we call pedal tone um a low note that's held out regardless if the chord changes it can make for funny inversions or it can just not be part of the chord or it could be part of the chord um, happens so this g right there is going to be held here as well and it's part of this chord it's not part of this chord right here and it is part of this chord, but it's a classic sort of way of telling you we're at the beginning of the piece and we're in the home key, because you're, you know, you're like. And then the next measure, it moves up, but it's still there. And the next measure, it moves up even further. It's not part of the key. And then it comes and settles down. So this is saying you're in the key of G. Later we'll see other pedal or repeated notes that help us understand other tonality or focal points of the harmony. It's a device that Bach likes to use a lot here. Also, I just want to point out that inside of this, what looks fairly static in terms of this texture, the architecture looks all the same. The, the, the lines, they go up and down and down and that kind of thing. There's actually a really cool thing happening here. This note comes up to this note, which comes up to this note, which comes up to there. So even though it's sort of static in terms of its contour and there's a lot of notes and the G is stationary, we're hearing this. We're hearing and then and then this and then those kind of things are inside Bach almost all the time. He's very aware of his outer voices and has inner voices and things too. He'll do funny skips um, that seemingly break the line, but sometimes it's for range of the instrument, but often it creates a compound line out of what would be a smooth line. So you can hear things poking out high and low. So let's take a look at this then. This is a, oh, this is, sorry, 
what I was going to say earlier is if this is my non-chord tone here, generally, especially in this first pattern, it's going to be a, a similar thing. Let me grab the same color pen so we don't get confused. Right there and right there and right there. And this is not going to stay true for everywhere, but in this first pattern where he's talking to us, that's the case. And so this is a C, E, G, which is my four chord. Now, when you have a pedal point and it's part of the chord, you can put the figured bass in, 6-4, because the fifth's in the bass. But here, this is uh, not part of the chord, right? This is an F sharp and a C, and I know there's no A in there, but it's implied. This is an F sharp A, C, F sharp diminished chord, which would be seven, and it's a... Uh, Seven diminished. It's our it's our substitute for the dominant. We don't have to put a figure base on it because this just obstructs that. You don't have to worry about that. But here we are back again, right? So Bach has gone one subdominant substitute dominant, and then there like that. Okay. Now what what is Bach going to do next? Um, generally, after this happens, his pieces will move off and make a modulation to another key. Um, usually the dominant, or if he's in major, it could be the relative major. Sorry, if he's in minor, it could be the relative major. And I just want to point out, see this C sharp right here? C sharp right there and C sharp right there. So if you have a scale that's F sharp and C sharp, that's the key of D, which is the dominant right there. So he is at least moving to that place. C sharps, C sharps. C sharps, C sharps, C sharps. And regardless of whether you want to believe it or not, your ears are going to say instead of this scale, you're going to hear, and it's not actually Lydian, like that sounds the way I played it. What it's going to do is going to reorient yourself to be there. Okay, so scale alteration uh, is another clue that you can use when you are trying to decipher what's going on. Bach, but he's given us his statement. Now he's going to move away to the key of D. And uh, let's take a look at this then. So maybe I'll use red for some of these. This is a, a G, E, B. I get a feeling that's not part of this, right? Feeling that's not part of it, right? This is starting to look a lot like an E minor chord to me, maybe with a seven. You, it's debatable. But that C sharp is telling me I'm in the key of D right? Starting to, or temporarily pretending we're in the key of D. But E, G, B, that's a six chord right here, right? So first off, we can say it's a six chord. And it's in first inversion because it's E minor, right? But this is telling me we're moving into the key of D. And we'll probably want to keep track of that in the key of D as well. I'm just going to write that in red you can see that if I'm in the key of D, this would be a two chord, and also in first inversion, right there. So it has a dual role, a pivot chord modulation of sorts. And then this next one right here, it's kind of funny. You'd expect these to be non-chord tones, just like the off ones were here as well. But when we look at this, this is A, C sharp, and G, and it's a, a dominant chord, right? A, C sharp, it should be an E, it's missing, and then a G, right? And we can expect after a 2 to have a 5, so your theory of chord progression can help you understand what's coming up next. It's down by a 5th to the 5 chord. And so this is my A chord, and I don't need to call these non-chord tones, even though 7th kind of quasi-feel non-chord tones. This is just simply a 5, 6, 5, in the key of D. Now, if you really believe you're in the key of G, you have to go 5, 6, 5 of 5, it's a second year thing, but uh, yeah. And if I have a five chord, right, I would expect my next chord to be a one, unless I'm doing a deceptive progression. That would be D. And look, F sharp, A, D, non chord tone, non chord tone, non chord tone, non chord tone. But the D chord, D, F sharp, A, is outlined everywhere as he comes up and then starts to descend down again. Right, and so this is my one chord in D, and it's a first inversion chord because of that, okay, being at the beginning, right? I sort of just 
grab these things at the beginning of each measure. That's what we hear as an impression. It's kind of funny. Um, do ukulele videos, and we talk about partial strum, and you can you can finger a chord, and then you strum up. And if you stop on a string, it doesn't matter whether it's the highest or mid or lowest note that got played. The last note is the note that you hear is the melody out of that strum. Sort of similarly, the first note that you hear in these patterns will be the one that affects your sort of uh, large scale voice leading. Now I'm just going to go back here and I'm going to put myself in the key of D right there. Clearly we've made that happen. Okay. All right. Now in the key of D, let's keep going. So this is my one chord. E, B, G, F sharp, G, B. And again, I feel like these are just little neighbors, right? I call them neighbor tones that go in by step and out by step in the opposite direction. Makes a clean E minor chord. E minor in the key of D is two. It's not in root, sorry, it's in root position because of that being on the, the downbeat. So I think we're, we're fine. And two likes to go to five, okay? It just, it does. We, we know that by, by our study of harmony and progression. So we would expect this to be a five chord of sorts. And if you look, E, C sharp, E, A, C sharp, E, G, right? You kind of go, but what about these other notes? Well, the expectation of this, the, the way it's playing out, plus the positioning of these other notes, it's going to make it feel like you've gone from here, like this right here is. And this keeps it tied to there. That whole thing can be harmonized like that, right? So it's a dominant chord. The chord progression wants us to do that. The notes are there, and it helps you sort of select and say, you're a passing note, you're a passing note, you're a passing note, you are. So uh, this is kind of funny, because a jump up and a step out is going to be called uh, an appoggiatura, but I'll show you how it's just actually a passing note in just a second. And that's a passing note, and that's my seventh, my chord right there. So this is a five. And the fifth is in the bass, so four, three. Now, I just want to point something out. If the cello could have extended down below, below C and kept going, and if Bach wanted it aesthetically to be that way, and he kind of marries both, like it needs to come back up so it doesn't extend below the cello's range, but also he loves this, this contour, this idea to grab things out. But if you think about it, this G is right there, and this D is right there. So you could have played, had you had a piano or something instead, you could have gone. Keep going down. Keep going down. That's the last, that's the next measure. Right, so it's actually just a scale uh, that he's chosen at places to skip. And, and then we give them fancy names like appoggiatura as opposed to passing tone because if this had just kept going straight down, it would have been a a passing toe. Okay? Sorry, I bumped the camera right there. Right? And we expect after a five chord to go to a one chord, and that would be a D chord. And so D, F sharp, D, A, all these things here, right? Look like that. It's a D chord. It's another one in first inversion. Like that. Makes that not a chord tone. That not a chord tone. That not a chord tone. That not a chord. Well, yeah, kind of. Sorry, these two, not a chord tone, kind of, okay? Now, I want to point something out here. We've accomplished two things. We had our original statement. And, and by the way, it's not just for, for theory's sake. This is so you can hear this and go like, oh, I'm in this section now, and I can hear this going on. Oh, I can hear in this section now, and I can hear the movement with the C sharp and the, and the sort of the sequential patterns that are causing me to feel like I'm in there. But look right here, um, as we come out of this, right, we, we would expect the one, I don't know, to, to go somewhere else, anywhere else. And then we get this funny chromatic chord with a G sharp and an F natural. That's about as anti key of D as you can get, right? And so what I suspect here is that having accomplished 
this movement to D, now we're headed off in another direction, or we're heading back. It's a fairly short piece, so we're going to head back to the key of G. And he's not going to go there directly. He's not going to say, like, like, I'm in the key of G. Okay, now I've moved to the key of D. Oh, I'm kidding. That was a mistake. I'm in the key of G. It's like, now that we've done this, let's get back to the key of G, and let's have fun doing it, right? And so... Um, first off, I just want to talk about analyzing this chord here. Um, there's a G sharp and a D and an F and a E and an F, and it's still F, right? And a F natural and a, so like this. Uh, this one is starting to feel a little bit like not the chord tone, but the other ones make a nice chord. G sharp, D, F, right? So... This is a G sharp B D G sharp B D F chord. That's G sharp. I'm just gonna write this here. That's G sharp diminished seven. And we know that seven chords like this, diminished seven chords like this, typically act as a seven, right? Equals seven, right? Which would be of A, probably A minor because that would be half diminished in the key of A major. So he's going like, key of G, here's our idea, now move, key of D, yay, we did it, and surprise. All right, we're getting out of there. We're going to start doing other things. And I think you see how there's a C natural going on there now. We no longer have C flats. We, we might be looking at a return to the key of G, or at least looking at it like there. It's not going to confirm it for us in our ears right away. It's time to travel, but I think we're going to, we're going to reference this in our old key again, right? Because in the key of D, this is G sharp of A minor. A minor would be like a minor five, and that's kind of weird in the key of D major. But if we're in the key of G minor, or we're heading back there, then that would be the two chord. And that's, that's pretty good. So... You know we're gonna we're gonna go with that for right now. I'm gonna return myself to the key of key of G, and maybe then this is my five chord. Now different people will have different ways to think about that. I do like to just see these. Oh dear, I'm having troubles with English. Sunagaris, these um, it's Japanese. It's uh, these connectivities or connection lines, through lines between things. But because we could easily find a a nice pivot chord here. I like to find one to get out of it too, if I can. And that looks good right there. And then it should go to, you know, one, but it goes surprise. We're not going to do that. So it's sort of deceptive in its progression. And so this would be, we're going to, oh, I'm sorry. I made a mistake there. Key of G. We're back to the key of G. There we go. Um, and since we're in the key of G, then this is my two chord here. This is my seven of two. So... 7 diminished, 7 of 2. I'm going to put the 7 in here. We have to decide on what we want to do for our figured bass. Like, is this the first note? So we go, well, it's just in root position. Maybe. Do we then go up here and say it's in first inversion at this point? Or do we hear this as a melody, and do we hear this point underneath, this pedal point sort of going on right there, which is going to resolve down? Let me just play through this. I'm going to make a decision just on how I hear it. So... For myself, I feel like the pattern's broken, and you can have your own opinion, or another teacher could say, no, we're not going to do that. But I kind of feel like that's the, the anchor point for this whole thing, because it's, it's pervasive, it's the lowest note, it holds out like this the whole time. And if that's the case, and then I'm going to call that D, then I'm going to call this a 4-3, because G sharp, B, D, right? Right, fifth in the bass, okay? And here we are... Um, we have uh, 
C, an E, an A. This is going to be a, you know, passing tones. All right. This is interesting. We should talk about that in just a minute. Because the pattern is broken here like this. It's, um, it's... So again, this is my two chord, A minor. It's got the C in the bass, so it's six right there. And um, two should go to five and five should go to one. Has the same thing here and same thing here. I, I just want to point out that with this here, this is clearly arpeggiating the chord and then it steps down and then arpeggiates the chord again, right? Here with the F sharp, there's two functional reasons for this. One is that with the F sharp, as opposed to the E, the scale then brings us down to the next note where he wants to be right there. So there's a functional reason for that. But also, if you hear this with the E, like you do right there, then it's clearly an A minor chord. But when you hear this, that's like an F sharp diminished, which is like an incomplete five seven chord right there so i don't know if i'd get too far in the weeds on this but it's worth seeing that that this has a functional use to get us smoothly into the next note that we want to go to here but two should go to five and five should go to one so five here should have gone to one and it was like oops surprise not going to do that right and then here two should go to five this is a quasi five i'm just gonna acknowledge that well it's like a seven right it's like a seven diminished which is it's missing the the d but feels a lot like a dominant chord there so it's a substitute for five and it should go to one and look there's another oops right or sorry two should go to five yeah yeah okay so but let's let's take a look at this then d sharp f sharp a that's all the notes so d sharp Hold on. F sharp A equals D sharp diminished, which is seven of E. Okay. So um, I would expect this to be an E chord because you're going to go from here, this is my D sharp diminished, to here. Like that. And sure enough, we have uh, E, G, sorry, G, E, G, right? And then, you know, down here and down there. Like, it, it's, it's there. Just this much alone coming after this will make it sound like it happened because we're here. And then... G, E minor is my sixth chord, yes? Like that right there. And this would be labeled seven diminished of six. Because it's a chromatic chord that's seven for that. And I just want to point out that uh, Bach has done a sequence here. It's not quite the same contour, so it's not necessarily a melodic sequence, but sequences can be harmonic as well. He did a thing where he's coming out and going, I'm going to go five, one, oops, surprise, sort of a deceptive thing. And then he goes seven of a chord, right? And then he goes, I'm coming back to my one, oops, surprise, seven of another chord, right? So he's using a sequence here, which is really cool to listen for, right? Okay. Well... Uh, I want to talk about this in a minute, but we'll just come to here first. So if we look here, I've got an F sharp and a C and a D. And this is one of those times like when we were up, where were we? Here, where we said, oh, these could be non tones, but we found out it was just the seventh of the five chord at the time in the key of D. Look at the similar shape. It's identical. It's important to Bach. And even if you don't, consciously go oh it's the same when you hear it 
subconsciously you hear it, right? D, F sharp, C. This is part of a D, F sharp, A, C dominant seven chord. This is five, six, five, right? It's missing the A, it's incomplete. Same thing, different keys, right? He is taking us to the key of G and we should have a cadence here, but even still, there's like, he's gonna, he's gonna play with us here. This D chord should go to a G chord and it does. G, B, no D, it's missing. And then the seventh, however, is not F sharp or an octave. It's not, it's not the seventh, it's a, it's a natural, which turns this into a G, B, D, F, which is a G dominant chord, right? So G7 is a dominant chord equals five, seven of C. So you thought you were getting back to the key of G, right? He does it in this really cool way with these sequences. It's not too obvious what's going on. You can't hear G confirmed per se, because he does this surprise. We're doing a diminished. Or, and then he resolves to hear, right? And then he comes and says, okay, get ready. Then he goes surprise again. And then surprise. And now we finally get our. And we want this to go, which it does, right? But he says, not yet. He doesn't give us a nice one chord there. He makes the one chord immediately into the five of four. And I don't think we're changing key here. I think this is just a subverting our expectations. So it's not a one chord. It's a five, seven of four. It's a delaying tactic. It's delightful, right? Again, this retransitioning back to the key of G doesn't mean that we just get into the key of G and know there's no troubles. This is turmoil in the country of key of G, right? I think that means this is a non-chord tone, non-chord tone. And we would expect a C chord here, right? And look, there's a C, E, and a G right there. That makes this there. So it's our expectation of the chords, even though the texture is the same, that can help us know what we're listening for. And so this is a four chord. And I'd like to point out that this G here persists there and there. It's not as... Dramatic is here, where you get it over a proper chord that doesn't have it in it, but it's the same gesture, isn't it? There's my G right there from the G chord, albeit altered. And then there's my 464, four, and this one is also a 464. Four. So again, he's using the repeated notes as a, as a method for um, sort of saying, oh yeah, we, we've landed. We're not done yet, but we're definitely there, right? And then, oh, well, look at this right here. This is very similar to right there in our original phrase. In fact, it looks highly suspicious, like it's the same thing. In fact, it is. So do you see what he did here? He took this idea and he said, yep, you've arrived home. Although, he, uh, we're not done, right? Because this here is another pedal tone right there. And this is my F sharp diminished. So there's my seven diminished. It's my first phrase again right there, right? And we'd expect a G chord here and we have it. It's the same, right? But then he says, let's go. Let's keep going, right? Uh, before we say let's go and let's keep going, I just want to point something out. I, I wouldn't overanalyze this. Uh, here and here, but do you see it has the same run coming all the way down here and the same run coming all the way down here on these like that and that hasn't happened anywhere else so you're going to hear that and hear that twice and you're like oh and they'll make this kind of relationship uh, depending on the book that you look at some people will say that six doesn't go to five and then we can find lots of examples like this where it does I, and I wouldn't overanalyze this. I think that this idea of one chord per is working out really well. This harmonic rhythm of 
changing chords every measure. So I wouldn't read too much into it. But I do think Bach is aware of the fact that, so this is an E minor chord. And maybe I'll, I'll do this in black up here. This is, or here, this is E minor, right? Okay. And this is D, no wait, hold on. I'm sorry, we're in the wrong spot. This is E minor right here, right? And it's coming to the five chord, which is my D seven chord right there, okay? What would really be nice is if this went six, two, five. That would be better. That's what he's been doing other places, and that's the stronger progression. I just want you to just see this here, because I, I, I know that Bach was probably aware of this, even though this all fits in the E minor thing. If I take my two chord for this, that would be a... Two chord would be an A minor chord, right? And heck, let's even throw a seventh on there if we want to. Okay, and that would be spelled A, C, E, and G. Is that still on camera? That's on camera. All right, cool. Check this out. G, E, C, A. A minor seven. So it's like he's throwing in a bonus two chord right there, right? Starts on the seventh and goes down. So you could, you could hear this um, as, uh, you know, like E minor for this, right? Right? This kind of is um, intimating it's a D chord as well in between, but then you get to hear and it's like, not this chord. It could be this chord right here. I'll maybe I'll take it an octave so you can hear it a little clearer. It could be this. Now I'm not saying that you have to hear it that way, but um, it is. It, it it sort of smooths things out. You can see that there. And funny enough, it's going to happen here as well. If you hear this as uh, this and this and this and this and this, I'm not saying they're actually there just a scale going down, but embedded in there is an E, G, B, and D. That's like an E minor seven, which would be my six chord, yes? Right? Okay. That would like to go to two, if that's the case. Right? Let's pop over and take a look and see what happens. Two would be A, yes? Right? Well, C sharp, A, E, G. Ah, it's been altered, so it's a five of. Let me get that down a little closer, sorry. Right? C sharp, A, E, G. A, C sharp, E, G, right? Um, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, going to an A chord next. And it doesn't have to be the E minor seven before then. But I, I, I can kind of hear that, and I like the idea of that that's in there. This is an A, C sharp, E, G, right? That's a non-chord tone. Uh, we'll stay in blue. I don't think we ever leave with the key of G at this point. We do some wacky things, but I think we're always going to hear this like this, right? Same thing there, same thing there, right? So this is a five. Not a, it's not going to be a two chord because it's been turned into a five of. And this is the third in the bass, so five, six, five of five. So even here, it's like surprise, right? We we use the sequence with surprise, and then we use sequences with seven diminished to get us back to the key. And then we did five and then one. And this is the phrase from the beginning, but it's camouflaged because this is not a one chord anymore. It's the five of four, which pushes us forward and kind of makes it a little less obvious, right? And then again, after this is like, what are we gonna do, are we done? No, he pushes us in and goes, surprise, five of five, right? And then we should see a five chord here, and we do, right? There's a D, F sharp, A, and a C, which is the seventh. And he's playing this descending pitch game here as well, where we had the Gs before, now he's going C sharp, C, C, like that. Um. I think there's a couple reasons for this. We're coming to the apex or middle of the piece right here. We're gonna have a nice big cadence right there, right? And it's gonna be a half cadence, but 
he doesn't want it to seem too nice. There's been some ambiguity at the beginning on whether we were in the key of G or the key of D. He wants to make sure that you know that you're in the key of G. He, oh, and this is a half cadence rather than an authentic cadence in D, although he still plays with our expectations at the very last there. And so if you think about the way he set up this chord here and here, right, with the seventh in the bass, it's a very unstable chord. settled and fine like this, right, it's, right, and he wants that instability and that darkness and that richness of color to tell us that even though we're here, it's not done yet, right, we're not, we're not finished, but still, it's a five chord and the seventh in the bass, right, that makes that an encore tone and that an encore tone and that an encore tone and there again, right, and he does it again right here. Here he doesn't even do this, but then at the top here, this is a little cheeky moment where he goes leading tone into it, right? And then kind of goes, oh yeah. Right? You can almost think of this as a little tiny five, a five right there, if you want to. I might play it that way. I mean, if I were a cellist. My daughter is a very good cellist. I'm going to ask her what she thinks about that. So, yeah. In fact, I just want to take a moment here and say that I'm not a cellist. Uh, I'm a composer and, and uh, um, trumpet player, ukulelist, and uh, I have degrees in composition. I do a lot of writing and arranging and teach a lot of theory and ear training and stuff like that. But I also do um, recording production, uh, mixing, engineering, that kind of stuff too. So I, I think about this stuff a lot, but I also know that um, it'd be better to take it to a really good musician of that instrument who's played this a lot and has training and ask them how they, how they feel about it. Not that it's definitive by one person, but they'll have a lot more nuance and thought. Uh, my daughter has played this piece hundreds of times probably and, uh, and practiced it for hours and hours. So she'll have much more developed and nuanced ideas about how she feels about things. Plus, she's a very educated uh, musician as well. She's got theory degrees and, and stuff as well. So we will have a conversation about this at some time. All right. Half cadence right there. I'm just going to stick that there as well. Five, two, just to remind ourselves. Right? And then I think it's just a five chord right there. Um, what is the rest of this here? Um, it's, it's far less developed than the first part. Uh, I'll just tip my hat on that first or, or, or spoil that right now, um, to let you know that, um, it doesn't, it doesn't do the same thing. It doesn't have the same, um, stuff. It's almost like he's worked out a lot now. And now his job is to say, okay, we've done this much piece. Now we're going to do the, we've come to the middle. We have to do the rest but it's more like a sprint home at this point. Uh, not that there's not a lot of distance to cover. I mean, he keeps the proportions appropriate in terms of length and things, um, but, but there's less going on to work out harmonically. The first part, that first page, that was very standard Bach writing for these kind of suites and, um, and um, dances and things like that to have a, an idea and inventions and then move away to the new key and then work your way back. It's almost like he could have, he could have finished this piece off here. He could have tacked this on there and gone back to the key of G into a nice, you know, authentic cadence and, and finished the piece. But it's a prelude. It doesn't have that same dance form as some of the other pieces in the, in the suite. It's a little more free form. And so he's gonna, he's gonna go a little longer here. And so he says, not an authentic cadence and finish the piece. Now we'll do a half cadence and then we'll run and do stuff that's cool to the end, right? It's a little more free form than that way, but it doesn't have a job like the first half did as much. So um, lots of books and, uh, and people on the internet and other places just call this a dominant prep or dominant um, prolongation, just meaning it's all over the five chord. And when you think about it, it kind of works that way. Let me show you what I mean by that. So he marches from here up to there. Actually, if you listen to it, it's like, right? 
And then here, right? Or right? So it's it's you know it's the same kind of um, it's missing one note, but and then it does this, right? And then it does something different. But if you think of it like da and this here, right? is an idea and then it's repeated here but it's stepped up and it's repeated oh i made a mess of it but that's okay then we can look at the outside skeleton of what's going on here right so starts on the a and then if you look there's a d and an f sharp and then this is the a and the f sharp again right it's outlining the d chord right and we're not in the key of d see the c natural here it's making a point of that right um, and then it goes from D to F sharp to A to C and then back down to A. So he's just arpeggiating up, but filling it all in with scales. The first time he does this. And the next time he goes. And then the next time he goes. Right? And you expect it to go right like that, like it would keep going up. But that's all this is. So this is just... We're just gonna call this a five, seven. And if you want to, you can say this is a four, three, like five, four, three. And then here it's a five, seven. And here it's a five, six, five. When that pattern starts over again, if you like. Some people just say, ah, it's just going up and coming down and not going up and coming down. But you can see that, that that's the device. When you say like, oh, I'm on the five chord, what can I do with it? Well, scales and arpeggios, and then you can link them together. In fact, a lot of people have suggested that that a lot of Bach is just about alternating um, arpeggios and scales, although he can miss notes and he can put many steps between parts of the arpeggio, like here. He's done an arpeggio up where he's missed notes in between, and then he does a little scale, then arpeggio scale, and then skip down, arpeggio scale, and then sometimes he does longer scales, like we saw on the previous page and things like that too, right? Those are kind of his game. Here, um, this is kind of interesting. This is a deceptive thing going on here. There's no E flat in the key of G. You might say like, why is that there? Well, I, I think part of it's surprise, right? And then, as though like when I hear that if I didn't know the rest of the notes coming up I'd be like um, I feel like it went in slammed into one of these diminished seven chords like a linear diminished seventh chord or something right there right and then I don't know and then if I had to do a harmonization of this I, I'd almost say like yeah, let's make that be an F sharp diminished seven. It doesn't really have a function because then it's just gonna come back down and become a D seven chord right there and all the way through the rest of this as well. But, you know, where does it come from? Modal borrowing because it's a G minor instead of G major, maybe. Some people have suggested that what's really happening here is he's going D, C sharp, C sharp, B, and then, you know, like back up to the C for there. So it's like the real thing is he's going like from here, and then it's, that's all it is. And then this is on top. So it's like, this is a little chromatic thing, and I can hear that, like, Mm, 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 mm. And so this could just be mirroring it with the half step above. I still do hear this as an F sharp diminished chord. It's not functional, it's linear. It's like the five of four or something. It's, it feels like it's just a, 
a surprise. It's not a cadence, so we can't call it a deceptive cadence, but it is a, a deceptive progression of sorts. But this whole thing is just D7. D, C, not part of it. Arpeggiate down, passing note, skip down, not part of it, right? And then here, some more D and F sharp, and not part of it. Like That's all just dominant seven chord right there. And you can play it as that long sequence with a nice surprise interruption there. Maybe it's so that it doesn't get monotonous. He's going to do it again because you, you don't want to think it's like this weird thing. Bach understands that if you do something once, if it was good, you'd probably need to do it again. Remember back here where he says surprise, diminished seven chord, and then, you know, sequence, surprise, let's do it again. He's going to do this here where it's like surprise. Again, in my ears, maybe because I heard the diminished sevens earlier, it does sound like I've been going, you know, you know, and then, ah, and then it's like, okay, no, we'll come back. Right? Mm -hmm, kind of thing, but uh, whatever. He's going to do it again right here as well because he doesn't want to make it seem random. It needs to be a device that gets used again, and it's cool. Right? So then we get to here, and 5, 7 should eventually go to 1, and here it is. G, B, D, passing tone, B, G, passing tone, right there. We finally get a 1. Hmm, is it important for us to go 1, 6? Well, maybe just to be, just to be, um, you know, like, consistent with ourselves. I don't know. Um, yeah, and then down here, it's like 1 chord. And then it rises up through the one chord. This is like a one, six, four, right? And then this is just a passing tone. And then he does it again. So here you get out of the five chord right here where you're, you're like, and finally get the one chord. And then arpeggiate down. What's going to happen? And he kind of goes like, aha, I'm going to do this to you again. Where you get this kind of... And it kind of feels again like he's going, he's going from the B to the B flat to the A, down to the G sharp, and then back up to the A. Same idea, coming down by half steps and then leading tone back in. And, uh, you know, he threw this in as a... Again, it's kind of odd. Where do we get that from? D harmonic minor? I don't think it quite fits. I think he's just hearing this is the half step below the D and the half step above the D, and then he's worming his way down through there again. Half step to there, like half step from here to here, half step from there to there, half step down to there, and then it leads us back to there, right? And, uh, yeah, maybe, I think. Um, I Like, so, good. What's going on here? Well, he has to have a bunch of devices so that he can spin out more time and give us things that are interesting to to go for. But you can see it, he's he doesn't want to go and explore new keys or anything like that. He just needs to go around and make it exciting for us uh, with activity and surprises and usually little loops of chords that sound good together. And this is what's going to happen right here. So out of this one six four which, you know, you could think of the D as foundational, like it's like a ornamented five chord, although I, I don't think so because the one's there. And if you look here, A, G, no longer G sharp, right? Neighbor tone, passing tone, right? Neighbor tone, right? This is a A, C sharp, E, G. This is A, this is my A7 chord. A7 is five, seven. Of five right now just like the beginning phrases were all about G right they had G pedal tones and things like that this section here which is taking us back traditionally would have D pedal tones or be about prolonging and and speaking and communicating the five chord right and so how does he do that well he has these long runs that outline the five chords um, he has, when he wants to return to it, he uses the five of five to get us back. And look, here's a five chord right there, D, A, A F sharp, non-chord tone. Uh, he even pretends we're kind of in the key of D for a moment there, just to make things uh, spicier for us, I think, like that. But this is a D chord right there. And so that's my five, 
right? I don't think this is enough to say we're in the key of D anymore. He is not communicating that, right? And then it comes to here, and then look, the C comes back, right? And again, if you look at it, this is just continuing the scale down, but he's not got no more room. So same thing here, this D would come down to a C right there. Um, I have seen it suggested that uh, some people have said that this is just um, what they call modal sequence, meaning that we were on the D to the D. Um, so that's Mixolydian, right? And then this would be, that's Lydian, and then Phrygian, and then this would be because this makes like another A minor type chord, or perhaps it might still sound, no, A minor chord should be two, which takes us to five. That's perfectly legitimate. If you want to say, aha, um, in the key of G, see this D to D is mixolydian, right? That's, I think that's fine to say, but then you want to be consistent and you want to say this is Lydian from there, right? And then this is Phrygian, and it's possible that that's all he was thinking, right? Uh, and then this is Dorian, right there. The Baroque is right next door to the Renaissance, and he would know about this stuff. He might have also just said, I just want these scales to go down, because he needs another filler device, and this is as good as any other ones, because it's going to get him to where he wants to be, right? Which is there, so he can have a 2-7 chord right there. And I've seen somebody else suggest, and I, I like this sound as well, if you look here, if you take that note and that note right there, that makes this sound, right? Those are the first kind of things you hear, right? And then if you take this here, uh, like there and there, then it's like, um, sorry, the next one, it goes from here to here. Same thing, because it's sort of repeated twice there. Um, but then, or you could go from here to here, even, right? And then this comes down to here. It's the same, same kind of thing here. And then this here. At the beginnings of these lines, these big leaps and the first consonant intervals you hear could sound a little bit like that, right? So you have, you know, outlined, even though they're not simultaneously done, they do kind of sound at the same time. Right? And then... Feature. Maybe he implied that. Not sure. Uh, this would be something called faux bardon, I think. The French Renaissance term. I'm really remembering back. I didn't look that up, but it reminds me of a class I took when I was in grad school that uh, talked about there was a singing rule, which was that you could just do sixes all the way down. It's like inverted chords, right? First inversion chords. You could just parallel each other in sixes like that, and it would be fine. Kind of feels like that. All right. Anyhow, this is my A minor chord right here, right? A, E, G, right? It's missing the C, but that's just because of the leap. Here's my five chord right here, right there. Five, six, right? And then I think we should skip over a lot of this as well. This it becomes an important note that holds out a lot all the way through. And you're going like, why A? Why not D? If D is our dominant, why not A? Because this is the fifth of the dominant chord. And if you want to play on the dominant chord, you could just do a lot of D. And that would be fun. like this held out right there. And, and, and say like, okay, there's my so, do, right? Like, right? You could just hear this. But if he keeps this here up top, then this is like the fifth of the dominant key, the fifth of the mixolydian. And that means that it's common to both that chord right here, right? And also this chord's equivalent of five chord, which would be there, right? 
Like when you write a canon, you want to have a lot of uh, do, re, mi, fa, so, so, because it's common to both the one and the five chord, so it gets double duty, or you can use it in both chords. It's a nice stabilizing note, right? Similarly, if we're going to be going on the D chord right here, and we want to prolong this out, then we can do A chords as well if we have the A, because DFA or DF sharp A, and then AC, you know, and they, they make one on five relationships. And if you look at this, we're here and we go like, we go, I'm going to use a different, so you can see color wise. This looks like mm, 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 right? Or right key. Mm, 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 while this is like, right? You're supposed to hear that while this pedal ringing out. And then here, right? Well, this right here is an A, C, E. And that's like an A minor chord right there, which is the, the two, right? It's like the minor five of this chord and so some people will just hear this like just a melody and i think that's correct that's that's what you're supposed to be hearing linearly but it doesn't hurt to notice that by doing the a repeatedly instead of the d and then looking at these little groups this makes a d chord and that makes an A minor chord. And actually with the C not present, it could even be an A dominant. So it'd be like one and it's five. And then there's my D chord again. And there's my A chord again. There's my D chord again. And there's, hmm, it's tough to say. It looks like we're climbing out there, right? But then here, like you can say like, look, these three notes right here make a G chord, right? So against this background of this, enjoy it as a melody but you can also see that there's harmonic progression outlined here as well you could say ah oh, that's G and that's a minor or a maybe you know and like this is G right there and then here this well we went and then that feels like uh, this would be a non chord tone right this would be a non chord tone right there that feels like a D7 right there and then here looks like the G chord again, non-chord tone. That looks like the G chord, right? And then it just depends, like na 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 na. It's going down by thirds, right? So I think this is, if you think about this, this is a chord tone, this is a chord tone, because it's coming after the G, so this is my D chord again. That's my non-chord tone. But this, 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 this makes a D, top of the D, F sharp, you know, diminished kind of thing. And then here, this is the non-chord tone in this larger framework there. And we know that Bach thought that way a lot. He could see and hear these things in his head, planned it out. So this is a G right there. And then here, that's not part of it. And this F sharp and A is part of the D. And I, you know, you go like, there's no D, but it's been implied all the way through it, still in your head right there. So there's my F sharp third and fifths right there. And then here, interestingly, this doesn't count, but G, G, right? G, G, and these are like non-chord tones that, not G. And then here we go again. Finally, the final D7 right here, or just D. And all this is, is there's my D pedal the entire time. Are we still in camera? Oh, we're getting out of camera. Here we go, sorry. There's my D with the non-chord tone, the F sharp and the A and the G and the G, F sharp. This is just two non-chord tones as the G hangs out. And then the A pedal note, right? It's funny, if it's low, we call it a pedal, and if it's above, we call it a, sus a suspension. They're the same thing when they're persistent, right? This, but then it's swapped out and you finally get the, the repetitive D, 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 D. This is, this is him saying, okay, now we're serious. Here's, here's my, pedal saying we're done we're coming to the end and he does this great thing where he looks like he's going to arpeggiate through this chord again but instead of doing this and then going and doing a scale or something then it's just a chromatic scale right 
there's nothing to analyze here other than to say it's such goodness, right? Like. he was saving that for this thing and then you have to be a good cellist because this this line has to come out and it has to be in tune when it gets up here and this is a opened up g chord right here g b d it's my one chord yay and uh see this g right here now we're going to call it a suspension but it's the same thing that's held out held out held out held out held out right it's all one chord and here is my five chord right here but the g is going to be held out there so you can call it suspension if you like that's fine because that's what it is right you can call it five sus right but it's the same device but at the beginning it was below and in the middle it was here and then he gets down to the root of the d chord right there and then at the end he goes up high and he holds it up there it's it's, it's uh beautifully planned you can chart these things out and then when it gets to here and it adds the seventh right there five seven it resolves down right so this is like a four three suspension right there and we finally get ourselves a beautiful one chord right there like that and if you think about this being the the low note right there you can hear the perfect authentic cadence voicings that go on right there all right final thoughts about this first off I, I know that when people look at youtube videos they often just like look at three or four minutes of it if you got to the end of this congratulations and good on you um what what do i hope from this for my students uh first off is that you start to see a method where you can combine all the stuff we learned about chord progressions, what chords like go to what chords, and um, what scales infer. Because like when we saw that C sharp come in earlier, it was like, ah, oh, we're going to the key of, of D, right? And then we've learned about sequences. We're starting to mature and see it's a device to get us from one place to another and to give us excitement and tension buildup and stuff like that. Um, we're getting, I hope that they also see, or you see uh, there's a, couple idioms that get used a lot besides like these suspensions and things it's like this pedal tone idea at the beginning right and then this phrase gets brought back to indicate we're here formally see I mean it's fine to listen to it as flow but hopefully after analyzing it and I wouldn't try and do it by memory I'd have my score in front of me I'd listen to this again and say okay this is my opening phrase okay now I'm moving to the key of D I can hear that here's the surprise where I'm going back to the key of G and there's my sequence with diminished seventh and diminished seventh going to the sixth chord. And then, you know, even here when the first phrase comes back, I know it's not the first phrase because I got a five of four with that, that lowered seventh right there, right? And then these scales tell me also that I'm, I'm moving on. And of course, we all can hear this half cadence right there, but listen for the dissonance and discord caused by keeping the seventh in the bass. And then you just plot this out. This is a series of runs, right? That outline the five chord. Chromatic weird idea number one comes down, goes down, comes around. Chromatic idea number two comes around. And then from here on out, we have this last sort of modal thing. And then after that, it's all, it's all about the five chord. This whole thing's been mostly about the five chord, right? But this is now blatantly rushing. You can hear this through. I guess what I'm hoping is that you start to hear the form of this rather than, oh no, it's another piece I have to... I have to um, analyze. And not just that you can recognize the form, but you also use your theory that you've gotten from this analysis and say, okay, I, I can hear this and I also hear what's going on. Like, like if you've never thought about this ending before, you might be like, well, what do I call this? It's a D pedal point that's just letting this chromatic thing rise up, rise up until we can get the biggest sort of open highest voicing of the G chord that we can get here, right? These are all distinct. It's very hearable. Clock is beautiful just to listen to. I think that when you start to see and hear the underlying structure in it, then uh, it takes on an added dimension 
um, and you start to see some of the richness to understand why his music has endured so long. Last thing, uh, you'll have other teachers. They will interpret some of these things differently. That's fine. I'm not, I mean, I've taken some graduate courses where we've done some Bach and things like that, but, you know, I teach at a college. It's, it's one of the things I'm passionate about, but it's not the only thing that I do, and there are people that have devoted far more talented people that have devoted many, many, many years to this, and we can always learn from them. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks for however much you watched. See ya.